Science fiction is an existential metaphor. It allows us to tell stories about the human condition. Isaac Asimov once said, individual science fiction stories may seem as trivial as ever to the blinder critics and philosophers of today. But the core of science fiction, its essence has become crucial to our salvation if we are to be saved at all. As we fly past the second anniversary of Sikonia Phase 1 and await the announcement of the following chapters of the new Wendy Cry Saga, we are left wondering what Ryukishi will reveal in the upcoming phases. Since the release, many have speculated on who the spies might be and examined the parallels between the events of Sikonia and the Book of Revelations, but none have bothered analyzing the foreshadowing elements and thematic ideas that bind the story. As such, this video will be a prediction, nay, a prophecy, of things to come. Unlike Higurashi and Yumineko, in which Ryukishi only provided partial clues, Sakonia is quite possibly solvable from the start. Not just the central mysteries of who the spies are, but arguably everything, from the main theme to the game board conditions to how the story will end. In an interview, Ryukishi explained that Sakonia was similar to Evangelion, and that you can enjoy the ride without thinking, but you could also try to understand the lore and mystery if you care to. In that interview, Ryukishi said, For the next chapter of the Naku Koroni series, I decided to do something a bit bothersome. The previous works, Higurashi and Yumineko, were similar to serialized manga and particularly aware of the catchball between readers and me. I was looking at how everyone reacted to each chapter, clearing up some things that were causing questions and messing up with something that people thought was suspicious. This time is different. I am going to plan the whole story beforehand and systematically lay in the foreshadowing from the very beginning. This quote implies that all the clues and ideas are present from the start if only we pay attention. Sekonia is the latest installment of the When They Cry franchise, taking place a hundred years after the Third World War that devastated the planet. But humanity recovered from the brink of extinction thanks to nanomachines, artificial birthing factories, and a machine that examines genes and determines innate talents. During that time, humanity also developed VR technology and a tool of war called gauntlets that allow uniquely talented individuals to fly, shoot magic guns, and launch rockets, effectively allowing youths to act as a literal one-man army to the extent of negating the utility of traditional armies. In the rebuilding of the world after the Third World War, nations divided themselves into four factions. AOU is a faction formed around an alliance between America and Russia. KU is the Central Ocean Union, a faction formed around an alliance between China and India. ABN is the Abrahamic Brothers Nations, a faction composed of European and Middle Eastern nations. It is a union on shared Abrahamic religions. And ACB is the African Commonwealth Realm, a united African country under a single king. Additionally, there is LATO, the Latin American Treaty Organization. They are a neutral power that hosts the headquarters of the four factions. By controlling the world's primary source of spiritum, a new form of energy that fuels all nanomachine-based infrastructure and technology, including gauntlets, LATO maintains peace among the four factions by operating as the world police. With one individual representing their country, for a total of 24 countries divided into groups of three, they each fight in Olympic mock battles to stimulate warfare in an effort to avoid actual wars. But as the story progresses, human nature and a hidden Illuminati influence push countries to engage in more significant conflicts, with a prophetic implication that the world and society will continually deteriorate over time until we reach extinction. The Illuminati group, the Three Kings, reference Noah's Ark regarding their plans to destroy humanity. But this time, there is no Ark. Humanity must survive a plague, a global mass famine, constant earthquakes, a nuclear winter, the oceans freezing, nanotechnology that regulates the environment shutting down, and the four factions engaging simultaneously in World War IV, all without the possibility of escaping Earth on a space shuttle. Unlike in Yumineko, where we see the meta characters play this chess game, Sakonia takes place from the perspective of the pieces. While it is still possible to establish who is the game board master in the opposing side, it is not essential to understand what is going on, and I will reveal it later. The players are the three kings at the peace level, acting as the Illuminati and representative for God, and the Order of Prometheus fighting on behalf of humanity. In general, 
Despite nationalistic ties, every human who desires to live is on the same side, fighting against the three kings. But this begs the question, how do you determine exactly who is on either side? By solving the central mystery of Siconia, we resolve this question. Who are the spies? Early in the story, Jestress mentions that they managed to introduce spies in every faction, and one of the three kings assumes that there are four spies in total. Since the release of Siconia, many have tried guessing the identities of the spies, but the standards used by people tend to be relatively poor. For example, people feel that Angie could be a spy if he openly admits to the possibility of accepting money to commit murder. For most people, this seems like a good enough answer, but it is incorrect, as even Yumineko argues against that position with Eva and Rosa who refuse to kill each other for money. So, what is the proper standard for being a spy? Someone who wants to destroy the world. We obtain the answer by flipping the chessboard around. What makes a person human? One may guess that it is compassion or empathy, but the central truth is love. As the Yuri Idol nuns say, love is everything. At the end of phase one, Koshka tells Mieo that the problem of the world is that it lacks love, implying that these conflicts are based on people not having any love. Innate to all humans, love is a response to what an individual acts to gain and keep. It is what one focuses on in life that gives a sense of meaning and direction. In a sense, love represents what a person considers important and emphasizes one's attachment to life and reality. When a person cannot attach themselves to anything, they become apathetic, nihilistic, and seek to destroy life. Therefore, we can pinpoint which of the 24 characters are humane and determine who isn't a spy by process of elimination. Jaden loves Meow, and Meow loves Jaden. Lija accidentally killed three instructors and had to choose between the firing squad and the impossible chance at a new life. Between life and death, she chose to live. Kushka also mocks Elijah for spending all her money, which indicates that she is life-affirming. To be life-affirming is to love life and love living for the sake of experiencing the joys that come from being alive. Andrew's squad mates regularly criticize him for being irresponsible, and he indulges the idea of accepting money to murder civilians. However, he seems to respect Mieo's ideals while emphasizing that his price range for committing murder is high. These lines signal a desire to enjoy life no matter what, indicating that he is life-affirming. And even if one is skeptical of his facade of irresponsibility, believing that he is willing to commit murder for money, Jestress and Tojuru point out the absurdity of obtaining wealth while planning to destroy the world where you cannot use that money on anything. Categorically, Andrew cannot be a spy. Mariana is an antisocial person who loves getting points on her gacha video game, and she autistically clings to Gannett when she acts cute, showing that she loves her. During the Global Drone Massacre, Gannett chastises Mariana for being autistically cold-hearted by voicing that mass death will delay the world famine issue. Human emotions are subconscious reactive mechanisms in response to one's values. Hence, Gannett's emotional reaction in reference to how her friends died and the degree by which she feels insulted by Mariana's words indicates that Gannett loved them. Linji has a straightforward personality and lives by the principles of justice. She loved her grandfather and cried upon his death. As Tujuru emphasizes, those within the coup are more humane than other countries because of their family ties. Sujata loves the idea of being a hero and has clung to that hope, even though she knew it was impossible. Rukshana wants to pet, squeeze, and give kisses to Sujata, indicating that she loves her. During the global drone massacre, Stefania tries to get in touch with her mother to confirm her safety, which shows that she loves her parents. Koshka is antisocial and expresses a hatred for multiple things, such as being near other people, or how people, together, always make things worse. So her misanthropy might make it seem as though she is nihilistic and therefore a spy. However, the opposite of love is not hatred, but apathy. Hate is a strong dislike or hostility towards something or someone according to one's value judgment. It is impossible to hate without first having something you love. Although Kushka hates her body, she was happy and quivering with joy when obtaining a new one. 
Aisha hates the rich elite with their family connection that get to enjoy a life of comfort without any significant hardships. She loves experiencing higher living standards, but she hates that elites do not appreciate how easy they've had their life. Naima desires to protect her friends, and she lamented that she could not prevent the destruction of Paris, which she loved. Naima also experiences anxiety and self-hatred to the extent that she has trouble sleeping at night, likely due to the burden of needing to protect others. Similar to how hate is not the opposite of love, self-hatred is a misapplied self-love rather than a manifestation of nihilism. Self-love is a representation of one's self-esteem, a disposition to see oneself as competent to deal with the challenges of life and of being worthy of happiness. It is confidence in the efficacy of your mind to think and of your body to act. Misapplied self-love occurs when individuals value expectations or standards beyond the capacity of their body, or to love others rather than loving themselves first, and it forces them to orient their actions towards an abstraction or to care for others to validate their own sense of self-worth. Hence, their ability to act in service to these standards become a gauge for their personal value. However, this is unsustainable because such a standard is beyond human capacity. Humans are not omnipotent and do not have omniscient knowledge that would be required to always meet such impossible standards. It means that one cannot ever transcend the limitations of their body or act altruistically enough within this framework. So regret is inevitable, thereby furthering their self-hatred which can form a guilty complex. Only once a person recognizes this mistake can they stop hating themselves. A person experiencing self-hatred may seem nihilistic in that they are unconcerned with preserving their life, but this is inaccurate. Although they act in a self-sacrificing way, they nonetheless love and maintain attachments to life. Someone who experiences self-hatred while being altruistic can become nihilistic only if they realize that their self-sacrificing actions do not oblige anyone to acknowledge their existence or reward their selflessness. An individual is only nihilistic if they act in a self-destructive manner by seeking to harm themselves and others for its own sake. Nevertheless, so long as individuals with self-hatred interact with others and maintain attachments, they are not nihilistic. Leah has self-hatred for her role in being part of an idol propaganda Yuri group for an oppressive religious state but she feels emotional when members of the Order of Bath treat her as a comrade. In being recognized as a human being and an equal, she becomes emotional. Such emotions would not be felt by someone who is nihilistic. Chloe loves flying, but also experiences self-hatred for her success, as the system she is a part of necessitates crushing the dreams of others. Near the end of Phase 1, Chloe electrocutes Lyja and enjoys the nihilistic gratification of having power over a person's life and she explains to Miel near the middle of the story and then to herself at the end of phase 1 that perhaps the world deserves destruction. If I were to make a gamble prediction, it would be that Chloe is the one to receive the letter from the Three Kings, as she is the only one to doubt herself, and the letter echoes her words that the world needs fixing. Nevertheless, Chloe is on the border of being human, and she may become nihilistic. However, there is an additional qualifier to judge whether she will become a spy or remain loyal to Mieo, whether she chooses to think. At the end of phase 1, she screams to the heavens that nothing makes sense anymore. She no longer knows what is right and wrong. This act of questioning herself is the beginning of independent judgment. As Tujuru says, if you stop thinking, you aren't even human anymore. And as Tujuru emphasizes to Mieo, always think. Never give up on thinking, even if events seem absurd. But even so, throughout the story, Chloe is willing to delegate the responsibility of thinking to Mieo. Therefore, it remains to be seen whether she will choose to be human or become nihilistic. Within that choice is shown another qualifier that points to who might be a spy. The denial of one's ability to observe, explain or justify an action or event, withholding the responsibility to enact independent judgment, and passively choosing to not make a choice. Hence, alone, loving something or someone is not the only attribute that makes a person human. Humans are sapient beings, rational animals with the cognitive ability to utilize independent judgment and make choices based on what one loves. In always having the power to choose and needing to utilize independent judgment, 
humans have a responsibility to use that power to display their worth as sapient beings. If an individual denies that responsibility by only ever obeying orders or acting on duty, they lower themselves to the level of an animal. Duty is the moral necessity to perform certain actions for no reason other than obedience to some higher authority without regards to personal goals, motives, or desires. Duty is delegating one's own life into someone else's hands. It is obeying an authority's orders without enacting independent judgment. As Mieo comments, only a robot has the excuse that they had no choice but to obey. Therefore, a character is not a spy if they uphold rationality as a virtue and utilize their independent judgment. And a character is a spy if they refuse the responsibility to think by only following orders. Mumbotech acts with a samurai-like bound duty attitude, but it is all an act to appear cool in front of Linji. Furthermore, Linji says that Momotake did not act that way as a child, implying a relatively recent personality change. In the character title screen, there is a mention that Momotake does not respect anyone weaker than him, and after facing Linji, he held a dog-like attachment to her. It is rather obvious that Momotake assumed the samurai-like character out of love for Linji. But this begs the question, what happens when an individual loves someone to the degree of duty? and then someone murders them. For those who have read Rose Gundes, this is a similar situation to that of Keith, who lost someone he loved and became nihilistic. I will make the prophetic statement that Momotake will become nihilistic and embark on a dutiful, warlike quest of revenge, thinking only of enacting his wrath to kill Mieo and finding ways to make him suffer. Mieo is the main character, and his fundamental characteristic is that he is always thinking he cannot be a spy. Yet there are moments when Mieo hesitates in his responsibility to think, and Chloe berates him for even considering giving up and leaving the matter to God. As Mieo realizes, you can't ask God to think for you or depend on the authority of another to find a solution. You must think for yourself. But if thinking is also hard for geniuses, does it apply to non-geniuses? Sakonia addresses this question with an absolute idiot, Red Habao. Throughout Phase 1, Red Habao has terrible taste, cares about showing off to others by dating older men, and seemingly has no natural talent for gauntlet flight. Red Habao's family and the government spent 1.7 billion credits to make her into a tool of war, because she was related to the royal family and would serve as a political figurehead and an embodiment of state power. Although she occasionally seems smart, this is a product of her expensive education rather than raw intellectual ability. However, is being a talentless, incompetent idiot enough to seek the destruction of humanity? No. During the assault on the Mediterranean Sea, Ishak suggests that the princess should give up thinking and accept the outcome of the battle to the will of God. Nor agrees and delegates the responsibility of choosing to Red Habao. And just as it might seem that she accepts the advice of Ishak and Nor to stop thinking and leave their fate to God, Red Habao affirms that she will continue to think make decisions, and take responsibility. In doing so, Red Habao establishes herself as humane, while the exchange uncovers two spies, Ishak and Nor. Both leave the thinking and choice to God and others, rather than accept the responsibility to utilize their independent judgment and act of their own volition. Other characters even comment on this. When Ishak suggests that the princess resign her responsibility to choose and think, Abdu points out that doing so is choosing to be apathetic. Similarly, although recognizing that the princess is in a tough position, Nor refuses to think and leaves the decision of what to do to Red Habao, and Mariana chastises her for it. Hence, Ishak and Nor are spies. In his introduction, Abdu directs other characters to him regarding matters of honesty because accepting the facts of reality can be painful. Abdu is categorized as always being honest. At its core, honesty is the refusal to pretend that facts are other than what they are. It is loyalty to reality and the truth. A commitment to honesty necessitates accepting reality as an absolute and to always think. When one examines Abdu's dialogue, he is consistently categorized by an emphasis on honesty and adhering to stating facts as they are. Abdu cannot be the spy because he would need to stop being honest, 
something he cannot do. By always being honest, one is always adhering to reality and is continually thinking. Naomi seems emotionally stunted as a result of her gauntlet training, and throughout the story, she does not seem to express love for anything. However, she acts with benevolence towards others by analyzing reality to provide optimal positive results. She is always selectively kind and respectful to others according to egoistic consideration for their well-being, desiring to obtain a peaceful, cooperative relationship with people. For example, when Sujata complains about a headache, Naomi offers notes for creating an optimal medicine. When Jaden learns of Miao and that Mieo has multiple personalities, Redhaba assumes that Jaden has committed a human's right violation by confusing the identities of Miao and Mieo. But Naomi dismisses Red Habao's negative interpretation. Instead, she is able to correctly analyze that Jaden's confusion probably originated from CPP individuals continually hiding their existence. And when Linji provides an even better analysis of the problem, Naomi praises her and immediately offers a resolution. Benevolence and analytical optimization show that Naomi always thinks, and she is life affirming by seeking to provide solutions to problems. During the global drone massacre, Fatma voices disapproval of the religious authority who orders her to promote sending atheists to jail rather than helping people with their gauntlet powers. This concern highlights a commitment towards protecting civilians above nationalistic duty, which is life-affirming. And now, with 20 characters cleared as humans, two confirmed spies, and only two more spies to determine, we come down to arguably the two most important characters in Sekonia. Stanislav and Gunhild. Unlike Ishak and Noor, who merely delegate the responsibility of independent judgment and choice to others without reasoning, Stan has deeper motivations to be a spy, and we can outline them by establishing his two fundamental characteristics. The norms he follows regarding insulting people to their face and his refusal to disobey his duty. In his culture, you can say something that sounds truthful enough while you mean the opposite concealing the insult. What might seem a sincere, honest, and pure statement could in fact be the opposite. He seemingly does this frequently, although it is unclear which statements are definitively insults. However, it is possible to verify certain moments in which he lies, such as when he laments his inability to provide help by not having any political connections. Later in the same scene, we see Stan saying he will do all he can, yet he never contributes to anything. If you state that there's nothing that you can do, yet promise to do all you can, it seems contradictory, unless a hidden insult was intended. That Stan could try to do something, but he doesn't want to. Arguably, the most definitive evidence that Stan is a spy is when he convinces his squad to fight in the battle on Christmas Eve. Stan announces that he received an email from Mieo, saying it's okay to forget about the order of the public bath. But would Mieo renege his values? Even as he sought to convince Linji to stop fighting, almost risking his life while screaming about the principles of the order of the public bath? No. Stan lied. These moments confirm Stan's dishonesty and proves that he is a spy. However, something remains hidden. What are his motivations? Stan's central characterization is his insistence on following his duty. Upon his first introduction, he voices that his duty is merely to show up. When members of the Order of Bath explain their reasons for becoming a gauntlet knight, everyone says that they wished to fly. For Stan, he wrote that his reasons was for his religion and homeland, but that he honestly shares similar desires. Considering he makes the same face when insulting people, his honesty is questionable. The answer of the others are also telling. In merely wishing to fly, they fail to consider the context through which individuals obtain such power. By choosing to be part of the state, either by becoming a politician or joining the military, a responsibility is put upon you. Follow orders. But this can go against people's natural intuition to not endanger or harm life their conscience. Stan gives examples of people disobeying orders. A German concentration camp director saving lives during the Holocaust who was murdered for it, and the Japanese Minister of Foreign Affairs providing visas to Jews, who was later exonerated after his death. In these scenarios, 
Germany and Japan had gone functionally insane, and it was left to individuals to accept the moral responsibility to uphold justice by betraying their countries for the preservation of life. Politicians and soldiers exist in a contradictory existence, where they must follow their duty and act inhumanely for the good of the nation, yet they are still humane, with conscience and the capacity for volitional choice. Linji believes that justice is at odds with duty because one must utilize their independent judgment to uphold peace, while those who follow orders indiscriminately serve an institution that may disregard the preservation of life. When you follow your conscience as to whether an action is life-affirming or not, one's integrity matters above all else. As Linji concludes, if you save one life, you save the world. That is the essence of justice. In response to what Linji said, Stan either reflects on those words or disapproves by grumbling. As Stan argues, even though the concentration camp leader disobeyed, the notion of justice did not save his life as he was labeled a traitor and murdered. This emphasis on how justice did not spare him is an essential point. He further echoes this view when Mieo proposes his chivalric order and Stan reveals that he is a man who values his life. This perspective on valuing his life is crucial because it explains why he disagrees with Linji. If the state expects him to follow orders and he betrays his duty, they will kill him. His position is to always follow the will of the state, while disagreeing with those who go against it. We see evidence for his perspective in the story. When Tujuru pushes countries towards World War IV, the masses begin to call for war, and Linji's grandfather and other politicians fight global opinion by damaging their reputation for the sake of justice and world peace. But in doing so, they become a target for the world. After their assassination, Stan seems delighted. His emphasis on them being wiped out is a jab towards Linji and a validation of his worldview. Gunhild even reprimands him for not being more considerate. Linji's grandfather put himself at risk by not conforming to the masses that desired war, and he died pointlessly. As Stan reasons, if states and the masses decide that you do not serve the collective or national interest, you will die. Although everyone who became a gauntlet knight wanted to fly, they fail to realize that a nation can strip them of their volition, and possibly their life, when needed. As Stan emphasizes, gauntlets are not personal property. The state lent this power to them. Gunhild agrees. A gauntlet is not a bicycle that a person owns. It is a state-controlled device. There may come a time when gauntlets are common and seen as toys, but not in the current era. Accepting such power comes with the demand that one must give up their volition and obey duty. Upon realizing the implication of such a system, Linji screams in sadness that her grandfather died pointlessly. The state gave him the illusion of power only to strip him of it when he fought for the greater good of the people. Linji uses the analogy of Icarus's wings. It may seem like this power is yours, but it is merely a facade as you plummet to your death for thinking that you had freedom. In a sense, accepting power from the state and serving it is a Faustian pact. She even hints at this by emphasizing that the gauntlet is bound to their left arm, likening them to the devil's hand. Though politicians and soldiers might help protect the peace, accepting power from the state means that their life are not their own. Linji's realization shows why Stan calls Mieo naive. He understands what it means to be a tool of the state and the demands of his role as a soldier. He will obey his duty at the whims of the nation without thought. This position is the banality of evil, the choice to passively follow one's duty, to commit murder and genocide if the masses or the state desire it. By always obeying his duty, Stan avoids risking his life and ensures that he never shares the fate of the concentration camp director and Linji's grandfather. However, Stan merely choosing to obey his duty is not his motivation for being a spy. He wants to restore justice. When Linji's grandfather died, Stan explains how the death of brave people can lead to terror and depression, but also that acts of martyrdom can be a source of revelation, collectively pushing others towards the self-righteous path of justice. This perspective aligns with the concept of disaster utopia. The goal is to bring so much suffering and disaster that it forces individuals to change their views and work together. There are two moments that hint at this being his motivation. 
When Stan learns that the Emus, which regulates the environment, will crumble, initiating an apocalypse, he states that the human heart will succumb to chaos. It is an unusual morbid sentiment. He would not have added that line if he did not feel personal gratification from that news. When Naima receives an invitation to the Christmas Eve party, she is overjoyed, and Stan conveys in his contrarian insulting ways that he is now certain that humans are beings who show their true worth when given misfortune and trials, not blessings as he outwardly says. And this is the final piece of the puzzle. Stan became a spy to force humanity to suffer towards peace. By becoming a spy, Stan intends to allow tragedies to befall the world until all remaining individuals are forced to work together. Under his perspective, if you value your life and seek to restore justice while accepting the power of the state, you have no other choice. In recognizing this paradox, Mieo attempted to create a third alternative. Although soldiers must obey orders, the state does not have omniscience. If no one knows that you are disobeying, or you put the blame on something else that is beyond your control, you can get away with it. Mieo built the order of the public bath using this loophole, utilizing a conspiracy where gauntlet knights would pretend to fight, lose on purpose if it went against the interests of global peace, and avoid killing their opponents. In doing so, they hoped to give time for politicians to calm the masses and cool the flames of war. However, this was not sustainable, as military officials began noticing mismanagement and errors. When under direct observation and the threat of court-martial, this loophole becomes void. Every gauntlet knight had to confront Stan's binary perspective, sacrifice your life or follow duty. Although everyone struggles against this, in wanting to maintain their power to fly, protect their friends or provide for their family, every gauntlet knight leaves the Christmas party and accepts their fate to obey orders. This binary choice is why the ending of Sekonia is a fight between Mieo and Linji. Both resign their humanity, and when Mieo kills Linji, he kills the representative of justice and guarantees the apocalypse. When examined in isolation, the ending of Phase 1 seems to be a complete victory for Stan. Mieo's chivalric order only acted as a stalling measure. Every gauntlet knight obeyed their duty, Linji's grandfather died pointlessly by going against the masses, and as more crises arose, all countries agreed to a truce. This prevention of World War IV seems to display that the suffering united people and compelled them to ultimately cooperate. However, Stan's plan to enact a disaster utopia is equally a stalling measure. By causing Linji's death, long-term peace has become impossible. Linji's words that if you save a life, you save the world also apply in reverse. If you take a life, you doom the world. As my prophecy foretold, Momotek will demand retribution for the death of his waifu, which will lead to a war between Ku and Aou, and his efforts to kill Mieo will lead to World War IV. Despite the ideals of a disaster utopia, it cannot work. At the first moment that they are able, nations will return to their desire for war. But in Linji's death and the eventual push for war, we see two contradictions. Stan should have also concluded that a disaster utopia wouldn't work, and becoming a soldier goes against the notion of valuing one's life. By focusing on the second contradiction, we can explain the first. Although other gauntlet knights failed to recognize that a gauntlet is not personal property, Stan grasped this point. And if he valued his life, he would have never become a tool of the state. As a soldier, there is always the risk of dying on the battlefield. As Ishak points out, being a soldier is a job where you may lose your life at any time. Whether one obeys their orders and dies on the battlefield, like Linji, or disobeys the will of the masses, as her grandfather did, neither position ensures survival. If Stan had the foresight to recognize that accepting power from the state is a Faustian pact, he would have not chosen to become a gauntlet knight. With his talents, he could have become a doctor, and yet, he deliberately chose to become a gauntlet knight, all while knowing that his life would be at risk. The fact that Stan should know better is hypocrisy, and shows the truth of his position. Beyond valuing his life, he wishes to leave his country as the only one left, for the sake of nationalism. Such methods can only end one way, absolute genocide. Near the end of phase one, everyone gives a toast at the Christmas Eve party, 
But Stan hesitates. The pause implies that he is carefully choosing his words. He says Mieo taught everyone to be comrades rather than be divided into factions that hate each other. And the final pause, before toasting to Mieo, hints that he in fact means the opposite. He is toasting himself for successfully dividing the factions, revealing his true motives. In the scene where the Order of the Public Bath discuss values regarding sex and how cultures have different sets of values, Stan explains that all regions have different cultures that they developed over long histories, and that all have to respect one another. And he says this while secretly planning to commit genocide upon the human race, purely out of bigotry. And from that intolerant perspective, we see his goals. If the ABN faction successfully wipes out every other country and remains the last nation standing, everyone will exist under a single faction, sharing the same ideologies and approved religious beliefs. Furthermore, in the same discussion, as each character explains how cultures treat same-sex couples, Stan explains how his faction only tolerates gay couples on the surface. Officially, ABN outlaws homosexuality. And, weirdly, Stan knows in advance and brings up that 10% of the population is homosexual. When the Yuri Idol nuns hear that the Japanese term for bath also means lust, Fatma makes a yaoi comment, and Stefania implies that Stan would be interested. And Stan sweats for a moment before changing the subject. Although he could simply be uncomfortable with being shipped like this, considering Stan's prior knowledge pertaining to homosexuality and that the Yuri Idol nun would know him personally, there is a strong implication that Stan is gay. If this is the case, then his very existence defies the state that he hypocritically serves, whilst every faction other than ABN allows homosexuality. Given his comments to Jaden about the risks of suppressed heightened libido, it is quite possible that Stan is obeying his nation by abstaining from his own desires, while suffering from considerable mental damage himself as a consequence. Ultimately, Stan lacks the courage to live independently. He is a man without agency or value beyond being a vessel for the will of his nation. The height of his hypocrisy is that he often says that others are naive for not thinking their choices far enough, but this may apply to him more than anyone else. Even if ABN were to succeed in genociding all other factions, it is itself a union of different Abrahamic religions that came together by miracle after the Third World War. Though ABN itself may seem like proof of a disaster utopia working, without a common enemy, it would inevitably fracture along religious lines that seek to eradicate the others. The genocide demanded by Stan's hypocritical perspective will never end. His bloody peace is an impossible goal, and through his ignorance, his actions are utterly evil. Interestingly, there is a confrontation between Neymar and Stan that tests his nationalism and perspective. During the assault over the Mediterranean Sea, the Yuri Idol nuns give a speech about God and defending their homeland, that soldiers must kill invaders and force evildoers to repent. Stan says that their speech renewed his dedication towards justice and peace which hints at his nationalistic motives. But in an act of defiance, Neymar tells the nuns to shut up. She points out that God hasn't asked them to make martyrs out of anyone or to massacre the enemy. On hearing this, Stan begins to sweat. She highlights that religion is a personal endeavor, while he is forcing his values on others. As Neymar shows, if you have a position of power, rather than passively accepting the will of others, you can live as an ideal directly challenging the masses and heads of state if need be. Stan picks up on how Mieo influenced Neyma, and he recognizes that she is choosing to live by her sense of justice and think independently, to find the nation, God, and him. While Neyma calls Mieo naive, she still maintains a desire to protect the world and use her power to make the ideals of justice a reality. Stan agrees that Mieo is naive and also calls him an idiot revealing his true feelings. But Stan is incorrect in his reasoning for this perspective. As Neyma displays in her defiance, with power, you can tell people who act without thinking to shut up and, by example, show them how to live. Despite his attempts, Mieo's failure is that he accepted that he was merely a pawn lacking volition. His resignation echoes his inability to find a proper solution to Stan's dichotomy that a soldier must kill or be killed. 
As Tujuru says, if you accept that you are a piece in someone's game, then it's all over for you. Yet, Mieo subconsciously understood that his position was wrong. He was unsatisfied that the order of the public bath merely acted as a stalling measure that would only buy time, needing to depend on the state to bring about world peace. Before the Christmas Eve party, Mieo laments to Miao the ineffectiveness of his order, and she says that if he is patient, someone will lead him towards a place where he can show his true worth. The Three Kings fear this outcome, analogizing Mieo's potential to a pawn becoming a queen that can control the entire board. If Mieo truly wishes to transcend his position as a piece in someone's game, he must keep thinking, learn from his failures, and obtain the means to free himself. When Chloe asks Mieo what are their options, he admits that they can do nothing. They have great power, but their gauntlets require maintenance, limiting their functional independence. But Mieo concludes with an optimistic consideration. If they want to defy orders, they have one shot. As Tujuru explains to Mieo, to break the rules, he must become more than just a gauntlet knight, and he must be patient as the right moment will soon come. Before Mieo started his chivalric order, he expressed a desire to do more to establish world peace and listened to everyone's opinion. Gunhild pointed out that such desires go beyond their role as gauntlet knights. Aisha suggested that if they wanted to do more, they should instead become politicians. Jaden recommended forming an independent military force to smack down countries into accepting peace. Linji explained that Lato is meant to function as a neutral force that serves as the world police, but has continually failed to do so. The answer Mieo was looking for was in all those suggestions, and he could not find it because he stopped thinking, and the right moment did not yet present itself. After the global drone massacre, there is a moment that foreshadows this solution. An opinion host on TV discusses how the worldwide banning of drones gives Gauntlet Knights the potential opportunity to stage a coup d'etat, and there is little traditional armies can do to stop them. By taking control of Lato and the largest supply of Spiritum to fuel their gauntlets, every Gauntlet Knight would be free of their Faustian pact. When heads of state and the majority stop thinking and advocate genocide, it is up to individuals who live by their principles to lead the world towards a better future. As Mieo points out, by being the pinnacle of military power, how many people could they save? How many lives are they willing to abandon? When directly faced with this question, Stan has no counter because his perspective of always obeying the state is objectively wrong. It is as Gunhild summarizes, if you realize that you stand at the peak of the world's military power and recognize that you should act of your own volition for the sake of world peace, then that means that you've grown a lot as a human being. And now, we finally get to the last and most important spy, Gunhild. After everyone introduces themselves, Gunhild mentions that she and Stan share the same hobbies and taste, which is hinting that they are connected. Gunhild invited Stan into her chivalric order, and when Mieo starts his own order, Stan obeyed Gunhild's command to listen to Mieo, showing his duty-bound nature and revealing that Gunhild is the Grandmaster of the Order of the Blood Vomiting Death Growls. These hints point to Gunhild being the most important spy. At a first glance, nearly everyone predicted that Gunhild was a spy for self-evident reasons. She wants revenge on the world for what was done to her little sister. At face value, this seems like a reasonable motivation, but it is a red herring. Her motivations, and more importantly, her ambitions, go much deeper. Gunhild was factory born and raised into a poor family. At a certain point in her life, the passion of her little sister to become a gauntlet knight deeply influenced Gunhild. With the prospect of rising from her living conditions, she joined the military academy at a later age than most. However, Gunhild's talent to become a gauntlet knight were merely average, and in the AOU faction, talent is everything. If you are born with great talent, your life is made. If not, your choices in life are severely limited to living a life of servitude, with the implication that society operates this way so as to eugenically remove talentless individuals without violating human rights. Additionally, AOU has horrific conditions for anyone who strives to make a life for themselves without a high degree of talent, as evidenced by the requirements to become a gauntlet knight. Out of 10 billion individuals, 
only about a thousand worldwide can succeed. If you have average talent, you can only work hard and hope for a miracle. To make things even more sour, any who lacks sufficient talent to become a gauntlet knight must obtain government support. Old military men have a buffet of underage children. When asked about it, Gunhild implies that she also suffered with these men to be able to study. But with her willpower, she kept on struggling and became a world-class gauntlet knight. That suffering led her to resent geniuses who would easily climb to the top because they were gifted at birth. Gunhild frequently mentions how she is jealous of those with talent and holds deep envy and resentment towards such geniuses for having an easy life. For example, Jaden was born a super genius and immediately became a world-class gauntlet knight without much effort. He lives a blissful, happy life without any struggle, so much so that Gunhild calls him inhuman for not having to worry about anything. In Fragment 14, Gunhild and Mieo discuss the core dynamic of hard work versus talent, and she reveals that she is incredibly jealous of individuals who were born with a full house. Everyone does the best with the cards that they are dealt, but often, the lot you are given leads to insurmountable obstacles that seemingly limit a person's ability to flourish, and this applies to all factions. As Tujuru explains, the Ku faction represents the world before the Third World War, a society where your family ties and social standing matter above all else. We can see the struggles of living in such a society with Aisha. She was born poor and hates the noble elite who were raised with a silver spoon in their mouth, never knowing any hardships or how bleak life can be for those without the same advantages. The saying, you don't choose your family, is quite apt. And unless you are born into an affluent family, given the advantages of wealth, connection, and higher education, your chances to succeed in life are severely hampered. You can only raise your likelihood of obtaining happiness according to one factor, innate talent. Aisha is an exception due to her luck at being born with talent, allowing her to become a gauntlet knight and provide for her family. As she notes, in the coup, which prioritizes family, wealth, and educational background, there are few occupations that one can succeed based solely on talent. But what about those who were born into low-income families and have little talent? What of Gunhild? And that's the key. As Gunhild explains, she is an exception among exceptions. If an individual's cards are bad, if they are born poor or have average talent, the only thing they can do is cope with the promise that if you work hard, your wishes will come true. Because without that, no one would have any hope in their lives. However, despite becoming a gauntlet knight through pure effort and willpower, Gunhild does not believe in hope. She held that it would be kinder to take away people's choice in determining how to obtain happiness. When Mieo asks if individuals should be expelled for lacking talent, to prevent them from suffering further and force them to accept a path in life that does not involve as much hardship, Gunhild agrees. The implied underlying belief being that no one should experience the pain she felt. Mieo picks up on the implication, emphasizing that Gunhild holds her view due to her hard work at becoming a gauntlet knight. However, Gunhild's very existence goes against her worldview. She has average talent and worked hard. No one expelled her and she attained her dream. Her existence shouldn't be possible. To avoid confronting the contradiction of her position, Gunhild stops thinking and concludes that to have become a gauntlet knight, she must have been born a genius. The immediate shift when she remembers that she does not have any talent, refuses to accept that thought, then labeling herself as a super genius, displays an evasion and refusal to think. Gunhild further rationalizes her perspective by saying that it's best to leave the job to those who were born with genius talent. She argues that it would be wise for individuals to limit their dreams according to their level of talent, so as to avoid meaningless hardship, as they are statistically bound to fail. Gunhild concludes that if you care about people, you have a duty to prevent them from experiencing suffering. However, Mieo disagrees. What matters more than the pain you might experience is using one's willpower and giving it your all. If you do, you won't have any regrets. On hearing this, Gunhild is shocked. Her asking, is that how it works? implies that Mieo's words fixed a mental contradiction. 
While effort does not always lead to success, so long as you give it your all, effort is never a waste because you develop fortitude which you can use for the rest of your life. As Mieu argues, being a gauntlet knight is an extraordinarily harsh path, but not all paths in life demand the same level of effort and hard work. And Gunhild agrees. Giving it your all at something so difficult means that everything else will be easier by comparison. To present his perspective, Mieu goes to see students who are struggling, and he provides his traditional harsh criticism. In doing so, he pushes them to put in as much effort as they can, while also supporting them by giving advice and pointing out what they did well. Mieo hopes that he will be able to see the full extent of their willpower and potential. It is as Rena argued in the Higurashi arc Sekahiroshi Hen. Hardships can make it seem that life is harsh and painful, but it tests a person's character, inducing growth, maturity, and epiphanies about oneself allowing them to better enjoy peak human experiences. It is by facing adversity, rather than accepting the fate given to you because it is easier that one can use their volition to their furthest extent and enact their willpower with all their effort, forging their destinies without any regrets, and thereby living life to the fullest. Mion, Keichi, and Sadako agree. Their hardships were painful, but they learned from that and grew as individuals. As Rena explained with an analogy, while a flower that grew in a greenhouse without any hardships is ideal and beautiful, a wild flower that endured the wind, rain, heat, and cold in order to bloom has something more precious than beauty, resilience. While it might seem that Gunhild hated geniuses, this was merely a proxy for her actual resentment towards the metaphysics of reality itself, for dooming people to suffer if they weren't born with the right cards. She became a spy to save humanity from meaningless pain by extinguishing all of life so that no one would have to suffer. However, by arguing and debating with Mieo, she changed her mind. As Gunhild realizes, even if Mieo weren't born with the talent he has, he would have still given it his all to achieve happiness. In realizing her mistake, she wishes that she had met Mieo much sooner because she would like herself more than she does now. The fact that she changed her mind should not be overlooked as a small moment. Mieo changed her entire worldview. It is emphasized with Gunhild saying, Mieo, right now, I really do love you. By genuinely affirming that love, she let go of her resentment towards the metaphysics of reality and became human. Her motivations changed. Rather than lead humanity towards its destruction to end suffering, she will fight on the human side to create a better world that allows individuals to forge their own destinies. The hints of her new motivations are found in perhaps the most crucial scene in Sekonia. When Gunhild, Mieo, and Jaden visit a cafe restaurant, an ad to join the Gauntlet Knights appears on TV, explaining how the AOU structured their society by evaluating a person's inborn talent at birth. The benefits of such a system are apparent. By guiding individuals towards a career that best integrates with their talents, they maximize their potential happiness. A little chef with a heightened sense of smell would be happy cooking, and a person who has talent for keeping their balance would be happy as a waiter. But humans do not have a total insight into their innate abilities. It is only through trial and error, trying as many jobs as possible, until, by a miracle, Individuals recognize their talents and how to use them with a productive career so that they can be satisfied and happy. And there is always the tragic risk that people might never discover their inborn abilities and die feeling incompetent. Under the AOU faction, a machine evaluates your genes and outlines your potential career paths before your birth, which avoids wasted potential by guiding individuals into easily obtaining their maximum happiness. However, as the restaurant owner points out, it feels inherently disheartening to have a machine map out your entire life. There's a human desire to go on a journey, to discover that you have hidden potentials. But the system seemingly ends all hope for one's life. While Mieo initially dismisses the idea as the result of a rebellious phase, he ultimately agrees with that view. As he says, when the machine told him to join a military school to become a gauntlet knight, he hated the idea. He wanted to be a cat video uploader, but his talent scores for that were a D grade. And so, 
he gave up on his dream and accepted his life as a gauntlet knight. But as the owner says, he shouldn't have worried about it and still strive to achieve the career choice if it made him happy. As Gunhild reveals, she has average talent to become a gauntlet knight. The implication being that if she could achieve her position by pure willpower, Mieo could have achieved his dream as well. Upon hearing this, Mieo laments that the simulators are worthless and expresses regret, saying that he should have ignored them to become a cat video uploader instead of being a gauntlet knight. As Gunhild emphasizes, your destiny isn't something you're given, it's what you create. And right there, in that line, is the theme of Siconia. Mieo has extraordinary levels of talent to become a gauntlet knight, as his parents bred him to become one. But Mieo did not choose that path. He merely resigned himself to that life. And this is his failing. Indeed, he enjoys flying and seems satisfied as a gauntlet knight, using his genius level talent to the fullest, being the best in the world. But he only acquiesced to the decisions of others rather than enacting his own volition and committing to a path that would lead to his greater personal happiness. Making cute cat videos made Mieo happy, but since not having the pertaining talent required excessive hard work, he gave up and fell back on his genius level talent because it was less painful and easier than living the life he wished to live. By choosing the path of least resistance, he sacrificed his happiness and became a tool of the state. Despite Mieo's words that people should give it their all so that they won't feel regret, he lacked the willpower to commit to the path he truly wanted to follow and overcome the pain to do what would make him happy. And because of this, he still suffered from regret. His character flaw reflects the fundamental problem of the AOU system. It puts the cart before the horse. While individuals can obtain happiness by integrating their talents with a productive career that best utilizes their abilities, they must independently choose that path and commit to it, rather than passively accepting it because it was put before them. In addition, even though someone might feel satisfied integrating their talents with the career that best utilizes their innate abilities, that does not mean that it would lead to a higher degree of happiness than what they might have otherwise chosen to do so regardless of those abilities. For example, a clumsy person who has a talent for keeping their balance and being aware of the emotional state of others while having no talent at cooking would probably be satisfied as a waiter. But what if they feel happy as a chef? Perhaps they shouldn't seek out that path, as they may face insurmountable hardships, needing to work excessively hard to succeed. But if an individual values their happiness above all else and recognize that a specific career will lead to their happiness, then they should still do it because the pain and effort of overcoming such hardships is not as important as obtaining happiness. Through Mieo's hypocrisy and failure to fully commit himself towards happiness, we see Gunhild's new motivation. She wants to restore hope for humanity. But this begs the question, is rebelling against such a system a humane choice? In the Higurashi arc Seka Hiroshi Hen, Rena provides an answer. Renrika starts experiencing self-hatred over doubting whether she was correct to reject an ideal world that maximized everyone's happiness, Rena offers Rika two possible hidden choices. Rika picks the hand with one candy and obtains happiness. But when Rena reveals that the other hand held two pieces of candy, Rika thinks that she made the wrong choice. Yet, as Rena explains, Learning that there existed a greater potential happiness does not invalidate the first choice. When choosing how to obtain happiness, there are no wrong choices. And in wanting omniscience to know which is better, you overstep the bounds of what it means to be human. As Rika recognizes, individuals must not worry about how to maximize happiness because we can only be human in our limited perception of reality. Each individual must accept that fact and, independently, of their own volition, choose what path leads to their happiness, commit to it, and live their life to the fullest. The machine that evaluates your genes and outlines your potential career paths grant humanity the power of God, utilizing omniscience to guide their lives towards a state of hypothetically maximized happiness. But it requires that one sacrifices their individual growth and let go of their ability to choose what makes them happy. If individuals value their happiness above all else, they must rebel against such a system and choose to live their life by their own will. 
distant of wishing that humans prioritize their happiness by choice rather than relinquishing their volition, even if it does not maximize one's happiness and is built on pain, is why Gunhild says that the world is worthy of destruction in Fragment 15. Learning that the AOU caused her sister's death only further cemented her decision. Similar to how Rika was the hidden protagonist of Higurashi and Ainge was the hidden protagonist of Yumineko, Gunhild is the hidden protagonist of Siconia. She will destroy civilization but will try to save humanity from the brink of extinction and help rebuild the world towards a better future. A world where individuals can enact their volition, persist in their chosen path with willpower, enduring all hardships by giving it their all so as to never have regrets, and obtain happiness. From a certain point of view, the system of AOU is akin to bestowing a prophecy of one's life. Imposter Blue Mieo talks a lot about prophecy and how it predicts the future, but what is a prophecy? It is the written word of God that is certain to happen. And as Ryo recognizes in Yumineko, God is a being that already knows everything. In other words, if a prophecy is having omniscient knowledge of the future in advance, by reducing the concept to its essence, we see that the power of God is that of foreknowledge. In simple terms, as Elijah explains, foreknowledge is the wish to go back to the past knowing what you know now. And this element of foreknowledge is present everywhere in Siconia. When the four factions engage in worldwide skirmishes, Abdu says that some people would be happy with the announcement of war. And Mariana points out that while the overall stock market is down, the stocks in defense contractor companies are up. And upon hearing this, the order of the public bath laments that those who knew beforehand and invested in those companies made vast sums of money. Equally, this aspect of foreknowledge in the stock market is the source of Tujuru's power as a villain in the story. He established his own chivalric order of military journalists to communicate, collect, and share information so that they could act on it before the general public. When Tujuru visits the Lato military official, they discuss what cards they have. These cards represent knowledge that is not available to the public. So as to determine Tujuru's power level, the Lato official demands to see one card. Tujuru recommends selling environmental emis related stocks because he knows beforehand that they will crash in the future. Similarly, after Mario causes the worldwide environmental emis infrastructure to crash, Mari Carmen informs the order of the public bath that the apocalypse has begun and that there will be a food crisis. She recommends that Mieo and others secretly act on that knowledge by stockpiling food before everyone else learns the news. To reinforce the connection, Mieo even points out that having such knowledge about the future is akin to a prophecy. Foreknowledge is a fundamental element of Siconia, and it is at the core of the thematic conflict of the story. Gunhild is the manifestation of willpower and she is in conflict with the world which structured itself around a godlike machine that gives a prophecy of people's path in life. From these opposing sides, we see a conceptual battle between foreknowledge and willpower. However, the game board of Siconia is not merely foreknowledge versus willpower. Seshat is an integral character that also represents humanity. In mythology, Seshat is the Egyptian goddess of writing and measurements, with dominion over libraries and books. As her clothes in Siconia evoke an Egyptian aesthetic, it is a safe bet that Seishat is the same goddess. By establishing the significance of books and their importance to human flourishing, we can determine Seishat's importance in Siconia. At its core, libraries are collections of books, and books are containers of knowledge. Unlike a god with absolute omniscience that knows everything beforehand, humans are born tabula rasa without innate knowledge of how the world functions. We must therefore discover the fundamental nature of the world through continual observation, induction, and recursively interconnecting facts into the structured whole. When humans acquire new information, it becomes knowledge, the retained awareness of the facts of reality. For thousands of years, in the prehistoric era, humanity would pass on knowledge orally. Such a system was dependent on the fragility of the human mind as we evolve to be better at conceptualizing reality than retaining data. The human mind can quickly forget information, and there is a limit to how much an individual or group can acquire or remember within a single lifespan. But with the invention of visual auditory symbols, 
words that represent a concept and inscribing them on materials, it allowed the further communication and storing of that knowledge. This discovery circumvented the limitation of human memory. By around 3000 BC, in Mesopotamia and China, humanity independently invented written language and the capacity to store data beyond the mind. Humans were no longer dependent on other individuals to remember or to gather information by themselves. Through reading, they can increase their perception of reality from the writings of previous generations, while contributing to the pool of knowledge for future generations with their own written findings. The means to store data coincides with the first civilizations within that period and geographical area. Society and knowledge are inseparable. However, this system of preserving knowledge has two fundamental flaws. First, acquiring knowledge takes a lot of willpower and time sacrificing an individual's lifespan to continually observe reality and inscribe their epiphanies for future generations. And second, stored knowledge exists on physical material, which degrades over time and can be destroyed. Intuitively, the sight of burnt libraries and books feels like an act of evil because the loss of knowledge infringes upon all societal development and negates the time and effort spent acquiring it. When knowledge, libraries, and those who maintain information are lost, humanity is forced to rediscover everything from nothing, and it leads societies without access to knowledge into dark ages, which takes centuries for humans to recover. The collapse of the Bronze Age civilization and the fall of the Western Roman Empire display a significant loss of knowledge which coincided with societal decline. While many dispute the degree to which the collapse of these civilizations hampered the growth of humanity as a whole, it is quite evident that societies lacking access to knowledge experienced an erosion of societal systems and a regression of art. Around 1200 BC, kingdoms around Mesopotamia and the Mediterranean Sea had power extremely centralized in their states, meaning that those who recorded knowledge, scribes, were employed by the state for record keeping. It led to one of the first civilized flourishings in the history of humanity. But, at some point, due to debated systematic failures, harsh climate change, and a mass invasion of a group known as the Sea People, nearly every city and kingdoms around the Mediterranean Sea was burnt to the ground. All heads of state were killed, as well as the scribes, who were the only literate group in that period. Those who survived this crisis escaped from cities to isolated, secluded villages to save themselves. For nearly 200 years, the region experienced this dark age. Trade among countries halted. Records of written language seemingly vanished. And of what little archaeological evidence we could find, there was a near total regression of the craft of pottery. However, the Phoenicians, great traders who traveled by boat, were unaffected by this collapse. As they began to trade between secluded communities in the Mediterranean Sea, it became the knowledge base that other civilizations, such as the Greeks, copied from, which led to the development of the Greek and later the Latin alphabets, allowing those societies to crawl out out of this dark age. To a greater extent, the fall of the Western Roman Empire similarly came from centuries of systematic failures and long-term mismanagement that led to Europe entering a dark age that lasted over 800 years. Europe was only able to recover thanks to the preservation of knowledge as it was transferred from one area to another throughout millennia. From 100 AD to 300 AD, the Opian Library in Rome stored the greatest sum of knowledge of the Roman Empire until Constantine moved its content to the Imperial Library of Constantinople in Byzantium. Shortly after the division of the Roman Empire, the Western half, Europe as a whole, entered a dark age. For a thousand years, the Imperial Library of Constantinople preserved the knowledge of the Romans and Greeks, until the sack of Constantinople when the Crusaders burnt everything, including the books at the Imperial Library, marking the definitive end of the Roman Empire. But due to the flow of information between the Romans and Sassanid Empire, scholars and scribes at the Academy of Gandhi Shuper between 200 AD and 500 AD in Persia copied its knowledge until the Muslims conquered them in the 7th century. Rather than destroy this knowledge, Islamic doctrine emphasized the importance of gathering and preserving knowledge. The Muslims sought to bring together and translate as much as they could, and store it at the House of Wisdom, in the heart of Baghdad, 
which led to the Islamic Golden Age, as writing from other sources were brought together and scholars came to learn and contribute. This Golden Age came to a close during the Mongolian invasion and the Siege of Baghdad in the 13th century, as the Mongols burnt the House of Wisdom and all its knowledge to the ground. But, thankfully, the Moors spent centuries copying and transporting knowledge from the Islamic world to the Great Library of Cordoba in Spain. By the 10th century, Cordoba held the greatest book market in the Western world and survived the decline of the Islamic Golden Age. By the middle of the 13th century, its knowledge spread to France, and Université de Paris, also known as Sorbonne, became the second largest hub of knowledge in the world. From that, leading into the 14th and 15th centuries, it became the springboard for Europe to claw its way out of its dark age, as more extensive libraries across Europe finally began to flourish in places of prominence, such as the Malastiana Library in Italy, the Biblioteca Corviana in Hungary, and the Vatican Library in Vatican City. Those libraries, and integrally the invention of the printing press, gave birth to the Renaissance, leading to the Enlightenment period in our modern world. From the Bronze Age collapse, to the fall of the Western Roman Empire, to the destruction of the Byzantine Empire, and the end of the Islamic Golden Age, we can infer that the loss of knowledge coincides with the decline of society. And despite how much knowledge was copied, stored, and transferred from one area to another, countless upon countless numbers of books were lost, lifespans dedicated to studying reality and nature wasted. In turn, knowledge and its preservation are directly linked to the flourishing of society. And it is not merely preserving knowledge for its own sake, to the extent that it does not matter if humanity becomes extinct. As Tujuru says, a music score is just a piece of paper without someone to play it. You need both humans and the preservations of ideas to make life and reality mutually shine. Similarly, the importance of Seshat as a character indicates that these ideas will be essential to Sekonia as well. She is the grandmaster of the order of Prometheus. In Greek myth, Prometheus stole fire from the gods and gave it to humanity. This tale symbolizes how humanity obtained the embers of knowledge that became the foundation of their sapience and civilization. And just like fire, so long as a society preserves the embers of knowledge, it can kindle the fire into a blaze. Humanity in Siconia will use this fire to escape the coming global dark age and rebuild society. And so, is the game board of Siconia a battle between foreknowledge versus willpower and knowledge? No. Mieo is the main character, and he is an integral aspect that represents humanity. More than just acting on instinct and passively observing, humans can conceptualize and focus on reality to a higher degree due to our intelligence. In doing so, we can discover the nature of the world, of entities, properties, conditions, relationships, processes, events, emotions, ideas, of everything that exists. The process by which people can discover the nature of the world is thinking, the cognitive faculty that identifies and integrates the materials provided by a sapien being senses to explain or justify an action or event according to one's independent judgment. Thinking is incomparably important because through grasping fundamental facts of reality, humans can act creatively and productively to elevate our living standards. Furthermore, it is only with sapience and the ability to think that knowledge and willpower can manifest themselves. Willpower is not an arbitrary thing or accidental to the human condition. It is a secondary factor to thinking. The ability to think necessitates the cognitive effort to focus, keep thinking, and judge whether an answer is non-contradictory with the facts of reality. Equally, acquiring knowledge necessitates thought. Knowledge presupposes an epistemological method for grasping reality, and increasing living standards demands that stores of knowledge be updated when individuals make new discoveries. Hence, thinking is the foundation of willpower and knowledge. However, thinking is not automatic. It requires a high degree of mental effort and being open to the possibility of being proven wrong to amend one's ideas and tolerate opposing views to acquire new observations and attempt to be as objective as possible to live in adherence to reality. But due to a meta-ethical aversion to experiencing pain, most of humanity is intellectually lazy. 
Although people wish to circumvent the mental discomfort required when thinking, we are not gods with the power of foreknowledge. So humans have a responsibility to think as the ontological requirement to live. Yet, people nevertheless want pre-established answers rather than to think on their own. As Tujuru explains, humans have an innate desire for knowledge because it helps promote their survival. But, unfortunately, barely anyone bothers to verify the validity of that information. Most assume that whoever acquired the knowledge did the appropriate amount of thinking and that their findings are accurate. This flaw of human nature leads to a world where nuanced arguments becomes nearly impossible. Pure pressure reduces the number of people willing to argue their positions, and everyone becomes intolerant of opposing views. As Tujuru argues, most of humanity can only think in terms of zero or one bits. Do you agree with me or not? Are you with me or with them? This aspect of conformity suppresses diversity of thought, preventing individuals from arguing, seeing new perspective, and reaching better conclusions. As Tujuru explains, to keep humanity from sinking into total conformity, which might lead to the extinction of the human race, Humans seemingly have an evolutionary built-in safety mechanism, the non-conformist. There will always be a small minority of individuals who naturally disagree with the majority on principle. This non-conformity mechanism ensures that, to some extent, discussion and dissent will continue and lead humanity towards a diversity of thought. However, this system is suboptimal. Anti-conformists are in of themselves conformists. They rarely enact their independent judgment or seek out new conclusions, adhering only to the opposite of the majority. Showing the flaw of non-conformity, Tujuru triggers World War IV by creating false flag attacks that make it toxic for anyone to be part of the minority that violently oppose a global war. Such actions prevent non-conformists from resisting the majority of humanity that desires war, regardless of the fact that many do not want it. The point is clear. Not thinking leads humanity towards its demise. To be human, one must accept to enact their independent judgment. The responsibility to evaluate whether an idea is true or false, with reality as the ultimate arbiter of whether a conclusion is correct. Not the degree to which people believe it, nor the authority of those who espouse it. Alternatively, if individuals mindlessly conform and refuse to think, they effectively forfeit their sapience and lower themselves to the level of an animal by leaving their survival to the judgment of others. This ontological requirement is why Tujuru argues that if you stop thinking, you aren't even human anymore. If individuals wish to live, they can only properly do so as a human, which means that they must continually accept the responsibility to think. In essence, the commitment to always think and utilize one's independent judgment is called rationality. Hence, within the context and framework of sapience, rationality must be held as an absolute. However, the problem of individuals refusing to think and lazily conforming to the majority has persisted throughout human history. As Seishat explains, humans seem content to obey and have been this way since before the time of Rome. And so, the question persists, how can you force humanity to think? Ultimately, it is impossible. The pain and effort required to think is too high for most people to bother when they can take the path of least resistance towards an answer instead. You can't force people to think because thinking is a choice, one that must be made independently by each person if they wish to live rather than merely survive. The popular saying, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink, applies to humans as well. And in that analogy, we find a solution. If you always think, you can lead others by inspiring them towards doing the same. Throughout the story of Siconia, Mieo's key characteristic is that he naturally upholds the principle of rationality. After creating the Order of the Public Bath, he inspires many characters, and they begin to emulate his commitment to always think in relation to their own values. Despite his naivete, his character flaw lacking the willpower to become a cat video uploader and his failure to transcend his position as a piece, Mieo's commitment to always think led nearly every gauntlet knight to utilize their independent judgment, question their beliefs, and live. And, undoubtedly, 
his success in changing Gunhild's mind in Fragment 14 will be a vital factor in preventing the extinction of humanity. The point is clear. Individuals that choose to always think, argue, and reach for better conclusions will positively influence others into doing the same, and ultimately change the world for the better. So, with the perspective that rationality is a fundamental attribute of what it means to be human, it becomes the final piece that gives us a full picture of the game board. Siconia is a battle between foreknowledge versus rationality, willpower, and knowledge, personified by Mieo, Gunhild, and Seishat. They each symbolically represent the power of humanity. And from this, we can see beyond the game board and perceive which meta characters are on the side of humanity. Burnkestel, Beatrice, and Lambda Delta. Burnkestel is the Witch of Miracles, and the title character screen categorizes her existence in relation to thinking. If she continues to think, she remains alive. But if she stops thinking, she dies. As a piece on the game board, Mieo represents rationality by always thinking and will ultimately prevent the extinction of humanity with a miracle. Besides this, he is continually referentially linked to a cat, even having an alternate personality called Miao, which further represents a connection to Burnkestel. Lambda Delta is the Witch of Certainty, and the title character screen describes her as the embodiment of the idea that those who work hard are rewarded. The main culprits in Higurashi and Yumineko work hard to achieve an impossible dream. Because of their warped goals and willpower, they become the villains of their respective game board. As a piece, Gunhild represents willpower by becoming a gauntlet knight through hard work rather than talent. But she is also a villain for being a spy with the impossible dream of preventing people from suffering if they weren't born a genius. Beatrice is the Endless Witch, and the title character screen has her taunting the player that they possess the power to kill her. Beatrice's powers are that of restoration and resurrection, which operate in relation to humans not knowing the truth, such as what occurred on Rakenjima Island. As Burnkestel explains in the first Tea Party, Beatrice is the personification of rules that one must learn by observing patterns. In essence, Beatrice is a mystery, a truth that humans must uncover with continual observation and thinking, or learning the answer by reading what was already written down. As a piece, Seishat being the Egyptian goddess of libraries and books represents knowledge that can be either lost or restored. Her supernatural ability to erase recordings of her existence is further evidence of her connection to knowledge. Beyond Mieo, Gunhild, and Seishat, there are other pieces under the control of witches. Koshka is the Russian name for a cat, and her existence as the Pandora is referred to as a miracle. It is obvious that she is Burnkestel's piece, but Koshka also has an armband with the Cyrillic numeral 3 and the Arabic numeral 4. Lyja has candy on her head, so obviously she's Lambda's piece, but Lyja also keeps saying meow at the end of her sentences, and she survived the firing squad by a miracle. Both Koshka and Lyja are seemingly controlled by their respective witch, but they also have the other witch provide their blessing to them. It's almost as if Koshka and Lyja are the children of Burnkastel and Lambda Delta. Furthermore, Mariana is clearly a piece that Beatrice controls. She has a similar name to Maria and is also autistic. So if Burnkestel, Lambda Delta, and Beatrice have pieces that are fighting on the human side, there is only one question left. What witch is the game board master that opposes them? Who else could it be but the manifestation of the being that came the closest to being a god? Fetterine. In Fragment 16, Seishat reveals that the enemy of humanity is a being that calls itself God's representative, but hasn't yet revealed itself. In Higurashi Gau, Sadoko somehow enters the Sea of Fragments and encounters a Fetterine like character. Although it is seemingly their first meeting, Sadoko was referred to as Vire, implying a direct connection to Siconia. When this Fetterine like character asks Sadoko to name her, Sadoko says E, eh, E, uh, A, uh, which pleases Ewa. In Fragment 16, Seshat and Tujru talk about the Book of Revelation, written by Saint Yanis. The first three letters of Yanis are I O A, which can sound like E O A, and becomes Ewa. In an interview, Rikishi confirmed that Ewa had the same name in her previous world, confirming that she originates from Siconia. 
When Ewa pities Sadako for not remembering her, she says that those who have dominions over their lives are cruel. It implies that she is also a piece on the game board. All these clues confirm that Ewa is Federine's piece as the representative of God. And now, we finally have all the clues. Siconia is a game being played by Federine against Bernkestel, Lambda Delta, and Beatrice, representing a conceptual battle between foreknowledge versus rationality, willpower, and knowledge. It is the power of God clashing against the powers of humanity. And as a game, it has clear victory conditions. At the beginning of the story, humanity has a total population of 10 billion. But once Mario causes the worldwide environmental emis infrastructure to crash, the witches begin to throw as many additional apocalypses at the world as possible to test the resilience of the human spirit to survive against all odds. Sekonia is quite literally a mission objective, survive, but applied to the whole of humanity, right down to every single individual. When meeting with Tujuru, Jestress explains the victory conditions on the human side. One man and one woman must survive. Although considering the mentions that are made to artificial womb and male pregnancy, it is perhaps more likely that the story will have two biological males surviving, with one of them miraculously given birth. As in the rules of chess, the goal is not to preserve as many pieces as possible, but to checkmate the opponent and win. Similarly, the numbers of lives lost does not matter because so long as humanity survives, it can always rebuild civilization from scratch. But if the side of God were to win by bringing humanity towards its extinction, Ewa will have her harvest festa and control all of humanity as playthings for eternity. So, can humanity win? Can humanity survive a plague, a global famine, constant earthquakes, a nuclear winter, the oceans freezing, a zombie outbreak, nanotechnology that regulates the environment shutting down, a virus that induces irrationality, and World War IV all happening at once without the possibility of escaping the Earth? If you believe in the power of rationality and willpower and that the preservation of knowledge can restore civilization from a dark age, absolutely. As Tujuru says, trust in humanity. Furthermore, if the previews at the end of Phase 1 depict true events, they offer evidence of humanity's victory. In one scene, Seshat caresses someone, saying that they have a very cute face while they sleep. She also asks if they plan on sleeping for a millennia. The line that they have a cute face parallels what Tujuru repeatedly says about his son being cute, hinting that the one sleeping is Mieo, and the mention of sleeping for a millennia provides the clue to figure out his location. While showing the facilities to their new scientist, Vira mentions a door that leads to the future, freezing anyone for a thousand years. These clues indicate that Mieo will at some point enter this time capsule. When he awakens, Mieo will see that humanity is still alive and kicking, but society will operate differently than it did in the BW3 era or the BW3 period. Mieo's ideals will be held as gospel. We will see that the humans of this new world now live by the principles of rationality, committing themselves to always think. In accordance with Gunhild's new conclusion, individuals will use their willpower to overcome any hardships, giving it their all in all aspects of life so as to never have regrets and find their happiness. And with the rediscovery of stored knowledge, humanity will have escaped their global dark age. Upon Mieo's return, he will be celebrated as an idolized messiah figure, and in accepting this new world, Mieo will let go of being a gauntlet knight and will perhaps truly give it his all to try becoming a cat video uploader so as to make life and reality mutually shine. The ending will convey to us that, no matter the society or era, so long as individuals always think and give it their all, we have the means to be happy. And now, we must await for the next installment of Siconia to see how accurate my prophecy is. While Sekonia was meant to be sequentially released every year, similar to Higurashi and Yumineko, Ryukishi delayed the release of the next installment until the end of COVID. With the recent Lambda Delta variants of COVID, it could require a miracle for us to quickly overcome this crisis. Until then, let us await the prophecy of Sekonia, that so long as we have rationality, willpower and knowledge, humanity can overcome anything. That life, uh 
finds a way. <laughs>